How did the WWF manage to miss with Bam Bam Bigelow? After watching him for just a few minutes, you'd be convinced that he was the future of the business. So why, after two runs in the WWF, did he never reach the top of the company? Before becoming a wrestler, Bigelow took jobs as a bodyguard, a bouncer and even a bounty hunter. He also claimed that he was shot in the back in Mexico and spent six months in a Mexican prison. But wrestling was Bigelow's true calling and he trained at Larry Sharp's Monster Factory. At the time, it was one of America's premier wrestling schools specialising in training men with massive physiques. Bigelow was impossible to overlook at 6 foot 4 inches and nearly 390 pounds. He was an imposing figure with flames tattooed on his skull which made him look totally unique. In terms of athleticism, Bigelow executed moves that should have been impossible for a man of his size. Big men of his era were usually restricted to a ground and pound style but Bigelow broke the mould. Before joining the WWF, Bigelow was a journeyman, wrestling not just across the US, but also in Japan. In world class, he even convincingly played the role of a Russian named Krusha Yerkov. Many of the territories that Bigelow worked for crowned him as Rookie of the Year, and it wasn't long before the WWF came calling. The WWF tested Bigelow extensively on house shows for the first few months, where he wrestled exclusively in plain black gear. They soon realised that Bigelow's attire should match his personality, and so they developed the famous flame jumpsuit that would become his trademark. At just 25 years old, Bigelow was still a rookie when he signed with the Federation, and according to Bruce Pritchard, he was still very green and had something of a defensive attitude. Bam Bam was a pretty raw lump of clay, that you could mould with some decent foundation and some pretty good skills. I think it probably was overwhelming for Bam Bam. He had been used to kind of being out on his own and really his only mentor being Larry Sharp. I think that Larry probably fed into his head, don't trust anybody. I think Bam Bam kind of had that in his head without any validation to it. It seemed that Bigelow had a chip on his shoulder when he first debuted, but Vince McMahon didn't care. McMahon was always looking for characters that were striking and memorable. Not only was Bigelow a massive guy, but his head tattoo was a unique feature that made him stand out. As Bigelow made his TV debut, a storyline was created where several heel managers, including Mr. Fuji, Johnny V and Slick, all claimed to have secured Bam Bam Bigelow for their own stable. This angle made it clear that Bigelow was a big deal, with all of these managers fighting over him. In the end, Bigelow turned all of them down, revealing Sir Oliver Humperdinck as his manager instead. This repositioned Bigelow as a babyface, and it was a move designed to catch the fans off guard. Nobody expected this fearsome-looking dude with the tattooed head to be a good guy. He made a huge impact when he debuted on television, where week after week, he squashed jobber after jobber. He also proved himself in battle royals, which solidified his reputation as a strong competitor early on. Vince McMahon had big plans for the big man. He wanted to position him alongside Hulk Hogan. Bigelow wouldn't just be Hogan's tag team partner, but also his understudy. The strategy behind this was twofold. Bigelow would help to lighten Hogan's intensive wrestling schedule and at the same time, Bigelow would get the rub from Hogan. He made his pay-per-view debut at the Survivor Series in 1987, which saw him team up with Don Morocco, Ken Patera and Paul Orndorff and Hogan himself. They faced the heel team of Andre the Giant, Butch Reed, King Kong Bundy, One Man Gang and Rick Rude. During the match, Bigelow was dominant. He ended up being the final babyface competitor after taking out King Kong Bundy and the One Man Gang. Ultimately, he was pinned by Andre the Giant, 
but not before making a really great impression on the fans. Unfortunately, this would be the peak of his first run in the WWF, and it would be all downhill from here. Firstly, Bigelow had a big problem in the shape of Andre the Giant. Andre took an immediate disliking towards Bigelow backstage, but he never said exactly why. Some have speculated that Bigelow got a bit too big for his boots with all of this early success in the Federation. And back in the late 80s, Andre was seen as the boss and he was often sceptical of new big man wrestlers joining the roster. Going into 1988, Bigelow teamed up with Hulk Hogan at Madison Square Garden to face off against Andre and Ted DiBiase, marking a high-profile start to the year. He ended up getting sidelined with a knee injury in March 1988, but he still managed to compete at WrestleMania 4, where he suffered a quick defeat to the one-man gang. By the end of 1988, he was out of the Federation. His knee injury was constantly nagging him, and he hated being on the road so many days of the year. Bigelow's final appearance was at Madison Square Garden against Andre. According to Bret Hart in his autobiography, Andre roughed Bigelow up so badly, he nearly killed him. Bigelow wouldn't be seen back in the WWF until the end of 1992. In the interim, he wrestled for WCW and went to Japan, and he even wrestled alongside Andre in the Universal Wrestling Alliance. Happily, Andre made friends with Bigelow during this period. When he returned to the Federation, everyone recognised how much he'd matured as a person. He was far more humble and level-headed. Bigelow made his re-debut in November of 1992 on an episode of Superstars. This time around, he was reintroduced as a heel, and he squashed a bunch of jobbers before defeating the big boss man at the Royal Rumble in 1993. Sadly, his match with Kamala at WrestleMania 9 was cut due to time constraints, but his pairing with Luna Vachon was a masterstroke. They were put together largely because of their matching aesthetics, but she certainly provided a new dimension to his character. At the King of the Ring, Bigelow and Bret Hart reached the final, and that showed that the WWF truly believed in him. A lot of his colleagues were surprised that he didn't have a bigger ego, considering the promoters in Japan had treated him like a huge superstar. But unfortunately, Bigelow started to rapidly descend down the card. McMahon was focused on rebuilding the main event scene after Hogan had left, but apparently Bam Bam didn't figure into those plans. At SummerSlam in 1993, Bigelow teamed up with the Head Shrinkers to face Tatonka and the Smoking Guns. It was a pretty decent match, but then he started a feud with Doink the Clown, and many saw this as a massive downturn. At the Survivor Series, fans were subjected to an atrocious elimination match featuring multiple doinks. Bigelow's team of himself, Bastian Booger and the Head Shrinkers were on the losing end of the competition. Next, Bigelow became a part of the Million Dollar Corporation led by Ted DiBiase and quickly became one of its biggest stars. He and Tatonka teamed up to compete in a tournament to crown new WWF Tag Team Champions. However, they were beaten by Bob Holly and the 1-2-3 Kid in the final match of the tournament. To add insult to injury, football player Lawrence Taylor, who was at ringside, couldn't help but laugh at Bigelow's defeat. Bigelow was angered by this and he got in the face of Taylor before shoving him. The seeds were sown for a confrontation down the road. In reality... Bigelow was chosen to wrestle Lawrence Taylor at WrestleMania because of his intimidating appearance and his reputation for being very safe in the ring. Bigelow, who hailed from New Jersey himself, was actually thrilled about the chance to wrestle Taylor, even if he was going to be on the losing end. A lot of people thought that this storyline wasn't a storyline at all and it was a real moment. Vince McMahon's incredible commentary really put it over as an unplanned event. He even went on to issue an apology and announced that Bigelow was suspended from the company. 
The match at WrestleMania ended with Taylor's victory. The bout lasted just under 12 minutes and Bigelow did a great job of carrying Taylor across the line. McMahon was reportedly really happy with the match's outcome and praised Bigelow for his incredible performance. And this really should have been Bigelow's time. He'd proved himself time and time again and his performance here at WrestleMania should have been his transition into the main event. But it never happened. According to Bigelow himself, that was down to the click. The men had been mercilessly bullying Chris Candido at the time and Bigelow stood up in his defence. While he certainly gave the click a verbal dressing down backstage, in the long run, this only made him a marked man himself. According to Kevin Nash, the boys had actually really liked him up until this point, but like a pack of dogs, they were known to turn at any moment. Like so many WWF performers at the time, Bigelow felt constantly oppressed by the click. In an interview, he said, everything is strength in numbers and the click had the numbers. You know, you had Diesel, you had Michaels and Helmsley, Scott Hall. This group of guys that were actually telling Vince McMahon what to do. A terrible, terrible time. It hurt a lot of people. To them, it became a joke because they had control. So it was like, okay, let's f with this guy now. Okay, well, we got him out. Now let's go to this guy and let's ruin his life and get him fired. Okay, now let's get this guy. And so it seems that the boys had ruined yet another wrestler's career. In this case, the career of a man who absolutely should have been a permanent main event superstar. On TV, Bigelow was removed from the Million Dollar Corporation after he lost a match to Diesel, which led to him turning babyface. But in the end, none of it mattered. Bigelow wasn't satisfied with the situation backstage. Towards the end of the year, he negotiated an early end to his WWF contract. His last appearance for the company was at the Survivor Series in November, where he was defeated by Goldust. But really, it was Vince McMahon's loss. Bam Bam would prove that he didn't need the WWF. He was already a massive star in Japan, and they welcomed him back with open arms. In May 1997, Bigelow showed up in ECW, where he had a very entertaining run. It was probably the best period of his entire American career, in fact, as he tore it up with the likes of Taz, Masato Tanaka, and Rob Van Dam. In October 1997, Bigelow beat Shane Douglas to win the ECW Championship. Then in December 1998, he signed a big money contract with WCW. After WCW had gone out of business, AOL Time Warner paid out on his contract until 2002 to the tune of $400,000 per year. While this is yet another case of Vince McMahon mismanaging an incredible talent, it's unlikely that Bam Bam really cared. He quit the WWF twice on his own terms and he was massively successful everywhere else that he went. <laughs>